What if it was possible to have local fresh groceries delivered right to your door? Think of all the free time you'd have. Well, Instacart gives unlimited grocery delivery for one low monthly fee. Forgot that special ingredient in your favorite dish? Instacart can deliver it to your front door in as fast as one hour. You can shop multiple stores, see deals in your area, and save time and money. I've been using Instacart for over three years. I started using them in Arizona, and I'm using them here in Florida. I love the time-saving convenience. They pick the freshest products, and they keep my eggs safe, too. To receive your first delivery free, follow the link in the show notes so that Instacart knows that we sent you and to help support the show. Instacart, never step foot in a grocery store again. Welcome to Empowered Within, a soul-quenching, transformational podcast that will set your soul on fire. Through candid and inspiring conversations, leading experts, celebrities, healers, and I share our journeys of how we've overcome challenges to living an empowered life from within. I'm your host, Jennifer Pilates. Welcome to another episode of Empowered Within. Hello, everyone. I am both excited and honored to have with us today Robert Raymond Riopel, an international best-selling author, app designer, entrepreneur, and trainer who has spent the past 18 years traveling around the world sharing his passion. He has also shared the stage with and trained many of the top trainers and thought leaders in the world today. With his high energy and heartfelt style, Robert draws on his journey from humble beginnings to financial freedom at the age of 32 to inspire individuals into tapping into their greatness. Realizing that he is not the only person that struggles, Robert's clues are open individuals up to the possibilities that lie within. Welcome to the show, Robert. I am so happy to have you here today. Oh, thanks, Jennifer. And, you know, we've already been having a lot of fun before that record button was even hit. And so I can only imagine what we are about to be talking about on this podcast and how much wisdom and hopefully great insights we can add to your audience. Absolutely. Since we already decided that any questions I may have had have gone out the window because we were having so much fun pre hitting the record button. (laughs) So let's start. We all want to know who you are and how you became the man with the clues for success. And you have an amazing transformational story, and I'd love to hear it. Will you share it with us? Absolutely. You know, the cool thing is where I live in Alberta, in Canada here, I, growing up I was taught, here's the box. Don't question the box. Don't even think outside the box because there is no box. You just do what you're told. And especially when it came to work, as an example, it, was, it doesn't matter whether you like the job or not. If it supports your family, has some form of security, then you do that job. And that's exactly what I would do. And by the time I'm 21, all of a sudden I'm being laid off from my third job. And it's all three jobs I'd had were shut down or and like the factory shut down or whatever. I started to get a little bit of a conscious about this, Jennifer. I'm like, is it me? Is it me? Someone hires me and all of a sudden their business goes <laughs> down. Right. And, and in 1989, I'm a newlywed and I'm thinking I got to do something to support my family, but I can't find a real job because our economy is not doing well. Here in Alberta, we have oil. And if oil prices are up, we the economy booms. If oil prices are down, bust. Mm. And so I'm looking for that real job and I can't find one. I want to support my family. So I decided to do something until I find it. And I start delivering pizzas for Domino's Pizza. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of that company or not. I don't know. May or may um, not have had a few pizzas from there. (laughs) That's right. And even during the podcast, you could order one right now. By the time we're done, it'd be at your doorstep. They may be a sponsor by the end of this episode. (laughs) (laughs) And so I start delivering pizzas and because of my work ethic, very soon, within a few months, I become a manager. Now my wife becomes my assistant and what do we do? We do what we know what to do. We start working hard, open to close seven days a week. And we're doing this for about a year and a half. And I don't know, Jennifer, if you, how much you know about Domino's Pizza, but you cannot just buy a franchise. You actually have to manage a store for at least a year successfully, meet a bunch of criteria. And if you do, then you're qualified to be a franchisee. And so now you still have to be able to buy or build a store. They waive the upfront franchise fee, but you still have to have you know, a good chunk of money. And we're a year and a half in, and all of a sudden we get the news from my franchisee. He says, I've decided I'm getting out of Domino's Pizza. I'm selling the two stores. I went into panic mode because what's going on in my mind? Here we go again. What did I do? Right. And I'm like to my wife, we've got to start talking to other franchisees. We got to find another store to manage. And she's like, 
why would we do that? Why don't we buy the store? And I look at her, I'm like, because we don't have any money. That's why we don't have any <laughs> I love like, it. Hello. <laughs> now, you know, I, I'm very, very blessed. My wife and I met when we were 13. We started dating when we were 16. We got married when we were 19. Oh. And we just celebrated our 32nd wedding anniversary. Please do not do the math of how old I am. Congratulations. <laughs> That's a triumph in today's day and age. Wow. That is amazing. Congratulations. Yeah. Well, and I'll tell you, I would not be here today doing what I do if it wasn't for her. Because as we say, I was innocent until I met my wife. And then she corrupted me in so many good ways. As an example, she's not willing to let me play smaller than I am. And so when she said, let's buy the store, let's figure out a way. It was okay. How do we do that? And we started learning and we made a lot of mistakes. Oh my goodness. Like including one person, he's, you know, I can guarantee you, I'll find you an investor. My fee up front is a thousand dollars. We paid him a thousand dollars, which we didn't have. Next thing you know, sorry, none of my investors are interested and your money is non-refundable. But every time we did a mistake, we learned something from it. And eventually after about four months, we had the confidence we now knew what to say, what not to say. And that's when we were visiting our bank. And one of the things I'm a big believer in is maintain great relationships with your bank, um, the bank that you deal with. You know, I, I even today in today's digital age, I'll still go to the branch. I get to know the tellers. I get to know the loan officers, the manager, because when here we are 23 years of age, we're wanting to buy this store, no clue how to do it. And we show up at our bank and to get to talk to a uh, loan manager for business back then, you had to know someone who knew someone who knew someone. And so we couldn't get to them, which is probably a good thing, because had we, we wouldn't have said the wrong thing. It would have kiboshed everything. Right? Mm-hmm. But here we are this one day, and we're talking to the bank manager. She loved my wife and I because we're hard workers. And we're in her office, and she's saying, so how's it going with the store? And we're like, not good. You know, we can't find a loan. And she says, well, have you talked to Grant? And we're like, no, we can't get an appointment with her, with him. Literally, Jennifer, she stood up. She took us by the hand, walked us across the bank, knocked on his door and said, Grant, this is Robert and Roxanne Realpel. They're an amazing couple. They run a Domino's pizza and they want to buy it. Take care of them. <sighs> now, had, again, had we been introduced to him four months earlier, we probably would have said the wrong things. But now we knew what to say. And we sat down and he didn't give us the financing for our store. He actually gave us a hundred percent financing for both the stores our franchisee had for sale wow i have goosebumps that's like almost unheard of wow right and and we were like oh we're franchisees now we've got it made but i'm going to tell your audience we knew how to run a store but we didn't know how to run a business Mm -hmm. two totally different things right there right and the first couple years because we didn't think we could afford an accountant Mm. We are, our whole philosophy was if there's money in the bank, we're obviously doing well. Obviously. (laughs) Yeah. Obviously. Totally. We'll do the, we'll do the accounting ourselves. You know, we're, we may be already doing 70, 80 hours a week in the store, but Hey, we got time to now do the accounting. Well, a couple of years later, when the government's knocking on the door going, uh, hello, you're a business. We haven't seen any tax returns. We, we buckled down, got a hold of an accountant. And when we got all the paperwork straightened out, through a lot of stress, the accountant, one of the first things they looked at us and said was, how did you two survive the last two years? There's no way you should have made it. See, I guess back then ignorance was bliss Mm -hmm. because we, we, you know, and both of us coming from poor families, when times are tough, we knew how to make it work. So that's all we did. We made it work. And once we started getting the numbers and I'm now a big believer, you've got to know your numbers. You've got to know like any business I start now, even before I buy or start it, my accounting team is sitting down with me. So we, we go through the numbers. We make sure. And also we started doing pretty well. But I got a, a little secret, Jennifer, that's probably going to shock you. I hope you're okay with this. Yeah. What is it? Because we started doing something that probably no one you've ever heard of has ever done before. We started spending more money than we were earning. Because <gasps> no, yes. I've never done that. <laughs> and by the time we're franchisees for eight years, we're over $150,000 in debt and going down quickly. And that's when we were actually introduced to personal development. Well, I shouldn't say introduced for the first time because I remember my brother-in-law came home the one day and he says, 
look, and again, I'm dating myself. He says, look at these cassette tapes I just got in the mail from this guy called Tony Robbins. My God. You need to listen to this. Yes. And I'm like, I don't need that stuff. That's, right? But now because we're stressed out and someone introduced us to personal development, we went to a three-day weekend. And in that weekend, we learned why we were in debt, why we spent money the way we did our habits, what was causing it, and how to manage our money. But more importantly, we learned to take responsibility for our debt because we were blaming the people that lost our investments or it was this person's. No, it's like you're the ones that created the debt, take ownership. And then we learned some very specific skills of how to get out of debt. And my wife and I did what, on, unfortunately, only in North America, I know the statistic, only 3% of people will actually use new information they're given. That's it, unfortunately. And wow. we probably would have been part of the 97% that didn't, but we were in such dire straits and stressed out, we're like, something's got to change. So when we left that weekend, we put into action what we had just learned. And next thing you know, we went from being over $150,000 in debt to actually retired completely financially free nine months later at the age of 32. Are you ready to lose inches, increase strength, and tone your body from head to toe? Are you ready for a total body, mind, and spirit transformation? I am excited to announce that I am launching my exclusive eight-week Pilates Return to Life training program. This will give you an opportunity to have a total body, mind, and spirit transformation of health and wellness to a new lifestyle. Imagine in seven days, you will feel a difference. In 14 days, you will see a difference. And in eight weeks, you will have your new Pilates body. So what do you say? Want to join me on the mat? Head over to jenniferpilates.com today. Space is limited. Use a special promo code EW and the word special, EW special to receive $200 off while space is available. Head on over to jenniferpilates.com and I'll see you on the mat. That's crazy. Yeah. While you're still having the two franchises. So from Domino's, let's yeah. be clear from Domino's y'all pulled it together and you went from $150,000 plus in debt. I think it was in to personal debt. in personal debt to retiring nine months later. Yes. But phenomenal. Now, we, may, we may, we may lose them as a sponsor because it wasn't Domino's that made us financially free. <laughs> yeah. Which is all good. <laughs> it, but here's the thing is, is yeah, we, ended up changing our life and creating that financial freedom. And our minds went, wow, that worked. If this much information gives us that result, what would more information doing do for us? And so we became avid students at that point. We started learning from as many masters as we could, because another thing I'm a big believer in, don't just learn one way. Don't just learn from one person. And it was during that time I found my passion was to be a trainer. And here's how my dream started, because here's what I want people to understand. Even though step one in my book is dream big, my dream started with the first step, which was if I could help one person, just one person do what my wife and I had been able to do, go from being deep in debt to being financially free, it would make it all worthwhile. And because of that first step, over the last 18 and a half years, I've been blessed to travel around the world several times, personally teach over half a million people in live events where I have audiences from 100 to 6,000 at a time three to five days long, where I'm on stage up to 12 hours a day, absolutely living my passion. And it started with that first step, if I could help one person. Wow. And that's kind of how I became who I am today. That's amazing. Can I ask, do you remember that first three-day training that you went to that weekend, who yeah. that was with? Yeah, actually, it's what I've been teaching for the last 18 and a half years around the world. Uh, my mentor, T. Harbecker, Secrets of the Millionaire Mind or the Millionaire Mind Intensive. Um, I ended up becoming his very first protege, the first person to ever teach his material other than him. And so BC, before COVID, <laughs> I, that's, <laughs> that's what I was teaching around the world because I was one of the few people that could teach all of his trainings. And so I developed my own trainings at the same time. And since you know the world changed, um, it, it's really interesting because here's what I want people to understand is I don't want him ever ever to think I'm any different than them. You know, I'm aerodynamic, so a lot of people have better hair than I do. But <laughs> here's the thing is I still go through the same ups and downs. And an example of that is March 10th, 2020, I have arrived back in Canada 
from doing a three-day training in India. And that's when my world changed. Stepping on the plane in Mumbai, everything was still normal. But 16 hours later when we landed, all of a sudden um, they held us on the tarmac. They wouldn't let us come up to the gate for a bit. When we finally did, there was two customs agents at the plane door checking passports as we came off the plane because the world had changed and things started to lock down. Because I had been in another country, I got put into isolation for the next two weeks. And so all of a sudden I went from traveling over 200,000 miles a year on average, training around the world to zero. All my live events being canceled, hundreds of thousands of dollars in revenue gone and not sure how long it would last. And in the beginning, I played the victim. And here's how powerful the mind is. See, I got home and I started feeling sick. Oh my goodness, what's this COVID thing? Do I have it? Do I don't have it? My wife refused to isolate me. She's going to take care of me. So she got sick too. And there was, for a couple of weeks, there was days where we couldn't even be awake more than an hour. We were so just drained. And, and this was our mind. We would sit there because our health system was so overloaded. We'd be on hold for hours trying to get a hold of when we can make an appointment. So we'd be zonking in and out of sleep, wait, listening to the on hold. You know, you're number 5,622 in the line. We'll get to you whenever we get to you type thing, right? Wow. We finally got our appointment. And we, a week later, we get our test. A week later, we get the result. Not like today where they're almost instantaneous. And of course, we didn't have COVID. But our mind had put us through so much. That fear. Made us, mm-hmm. That's right. And we ended up, as we came through that, we asked ourselves two very powerful words. Two very powerful words that change our life. And I, if people that are listening and, and taking their precious time and being here to listen to us, I want them to write these words down. They are what's next because those words will change your life because the moment we asked those words we went okay we don't know how long this can last we're not traveling anymore and you know three years ago we bought this beautiful acreage we're on with the idea that eventually we would build our own training center so that instead of me traveling all over the world students could come see me and so as we're having a discussion my wife's like well you're home now you have the time why don't we build it now and initially when we went into the fear mode of lack Yeah, but what if no revenue? You know, what if, what if, what if? But then we, you know, two other words that um, we kind of adopted was all in. We decided we're all in, we're going to make it work. And on December 12th of 2020, we broke ground on our brand new training center that's off the back of our house. And actually, I am now one week that I've moved into my new office with a 1,500 square foot training center on the other side of that wall that we've now got created So that as the world opens up, we've created that new reality. And I've gone fully virtual, digital, and I'll still travel around the world and do live trainings when we can, because nothing will ever replace that. But now I'll spend even more time at home and be blessed to have my students come see me here. So it's it's, it's exciting times. And had it not been for COVID, this would have been a dream that would happen three, four, five years around down Mm -hmm. the road if we ever got to it. Totally. Well, thank you for sharing that. Cause you know, one, that's so important to show that power of pivoting and the mindset that you changed. And two, just again, showing a blessing that has come out of such a traumatic time for all of us. And we can yeah. all have them. Like you say, it's a mindset and we've got to take that time and that moment to go, okay, well, what's next? Now I know sometimes, you know, if I'm having a conversation with someone and someone goes, oh my God, what could possibly happen next? I'm like, please don't ask that. Okay. Not in that yeah, way. No, no, not in that way. Not, not in, in that, that way. way. <laughs> and I want to clear that up for everybody. That is not, uh-uh. take it back, erase it, call it back. That's something else we should talk about. Yes. Let's talk about that now. Talk about how, if somebody says something, then you're like, that's negative. It didn't work for me. How do we eradicate that immediately in that moment? Because you have a wonderful process for this. Yeah. First of all, it's you've got to have awareness. Probably one of the greatest things that I've learned over the years, because I'm still learning, I will never quit being a student, is I'm always working on my self-awareness. So in the morning, when I'm starting to come to consciousness, I'm watching for the first thoughts in my head to see if they're supportive or non-supportive. Because there's no good, bad, right or wrong. It either supports you or it doesn't is the way I look at it. And so if it's a non-supportive in any way, the one of the words my wife and I use are cancel, cancel, cancel. And we'll cancel that thought. And it, we make it a running joke. If we're together or we're out or we're just sitting playing cards, whatever we're doing, if someone says something negative, one of us catches the first and we'll go cancel, 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 right? So, see who catches it first. Because we then use it as an as a, uh, anchor to cancel that thought. 
and then we immediately replace it with a supportive thought. So in the morning, if as I'm coming to consciousness, if I notice it's negative or non-supportive, I'll cancel it. And you can use words like, thank you, not now, get lost, whatever works for you. And then by, if it's a supportive thought, then I just sit with that for a moment. And it's like, yep, today's going to be a good day. And so that's one of the little techniques that I use, uh, especially starting the day when I, if there's any, and now anytime, because look again, like everybody else, I have negative thoughts. I have non-supportive thoughts. They happen, but it's how quickly can I catch them and rephrase them. You talk a lot about this in your book, Success Left a Clue. You are making this so simple on how to find success, whether you're looking for success just to get out of bed in the morning or to become an entrepreneur. It covers everyone. And I've got to tell you, one of the the cool parts about your book too is at the end, (laughs) you review everything and it's snippet and you re- and you're like oh my gosh like you're just embedding that in my mind and i loved that i thought this is so well written it's so well laid out it was quick it was precise it was to the point it's a book that will stay on my desk always now because there's this great reference that you can go back to and i want to say what an amazing job you did with it and there's so many cool things that i want to talk about a little bit that are in it we don't want to give it all away one of the things that you write about is you say choose not to be your greatest obstacle and I'd mm-hmm. love for you to elaborate on that. Well, you know, what's the saying? And, and first of all, Jennifer, thank you for those kind words. You have 20 minutes to quit saying them. <laughs> 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 and we'll even share later that, look, that was a 15-year procrastination right to do that book, and, which is a whole story in itself. But when, and it comes down to being your own worst enemy. You know, how's the saying go? If you had a friend that treated you the way you treat yourself, they wouldn't be your friend for very long, but yet we take it from ourselves, And so it's about honoring who you are. Um, I believe, and I'm a very strong believer in this, that the greatest gift that anyone can give this planet is to be themselves, whatever that looks like. Because when you're yourself, either people are going to like you for who you are or they won't. And if they like you for who you are, that's awesome. If they don't, that's awesome. <laughs> Because look at how much time and energy, and and this is coming from a former reformed people pleaser. I am like a gold medalist since we just (laughs) did the Olympics. Gold medalist people pleaser is what I used to be. And and I was like that lost little puppy. If I really liked you and wanted you to like me, I'd be like, oh, please, please, please. Oh, please, please, please like me. And people would be like, get away from me, you freak. (laughs) (laughs) And when I look back today at how much energy and time someone people wanted me to be, instead of just being me. And today, when I'm me, all of a sudden, I'm always blown away by the people I attract into my life. And I still ask myself, because this is where that self-sabotage comes in. It'll be like, how did I attract that person? Why are they coming into my life? I'm I'm not an amazing person. And I beat myself up over that. So I have to catch it, cancel that thought, and go, you know what? But I'm me. And that's all I can be. And I that's all I choose to be. So yeah, just really being aware of yourself and owning your greatness. I think that's great. And it's true. Authenticity will get you everywhere. Yeah. It yeah. really will. Yeah. And, and you've done a great job in that, in your book. Okay. So there's another one that I love that you wrote about. And it says, if you want to reinvent the wheel, do it later. <laughs> I read that and one I went. One of my favorite clues. <laughs> oh, I said, oh, no, he didn't. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I did. I did. <laughs> Share because, you know, we tend to do this. Yeah. We as everyone, the, we've all done it at some point, And this was brilliant. I mean, all of the writing is brilliant. But yeah, definitely dive into that a little bit because I think that's super important yeah. right now when people are trying to pivot and go, well, what next in a positive mm-hmm. way? Well, first of all, you've got to understand why we try to reinvent the wheel. You know, you can have a, a brilliant, even simple system in front of you. But what does our mind do? I've got to do it different. I've got to do it my way. And let's go to the root of something. Let's use the word kindergarten. The word kindergarten is a German word that stands for children's garden. And if you look at back why schools are the way they are today is basically it started with kindergarten where in Germany they needed the children to be taken care of because they needed both parents in the factories. And they thought, how are we going to be able to do that? Well, we'll take care of the children. 
And while they're doing that, they realize that if we take them and we educate them, we can make them our next set of workers. And why do you think school is the way it is today? In school, you don't look learn about finance and how to manage your money. You don't learn about practical life skills. And think about what you're taught. It's don't look at what someone else is doing. If you do, that's cheating. Cheating is bad. If you copy someone, that's even worse. If you ask for help, that's showing weakness. So no wonder when we come out of school, our mind's going, you know, the greatest way to be successful is find someone who's done what you want to do and, and model what they did. But our mind goes, no, 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 I can't do that. So our mind automatically wants to reinvent. And so what I say is, if you want to reinvent the wheel, do it later. Get the success, find the system, follow the system, get the success of the system first. Then once you have the success, if you still want to reinvent the wheel, go ahead, because at least now you have the success instead of being reinventing it right from the beginning and getting frustrated and not succeeding. So that's why that's one of my favorite clues in the book. Something else I want to mention to the audience, I'll just skip ahead to it now, is that if you go to Robert's website and you sign up, you can get your own clues during the week and they pop up. It gives you a clue and it's not a three paragraphs worth of information. Everything is so valuable that it's like it's got stickiness to it. It's going to stick with you and it's going to provoke that thought. And you're like, oh, okay, I better I better work on that. (laughs) And if you've noticed they tend to be the clue you need in that moment in your life. Have you, Mm -hmm. I I worked so hard on programming it that way. No, I didn't. I know before we even met, it was like, you knew me, you were sending me these clues. And I was like, it's like, he's here already. They're perfect. It's It's how the universe works. And I know that you do believe in, in the universal system and you do believe in manifestation. So what is someone saying? Okay, this all sounds great, Robert and Jennifer. I don't know how to get started when someone wants to get started with their dream and their manifestation, what is the easiest way for someone to step their toe in that puddle to really begin? Yeah. Just take one step. The reason people get overwhelmed is they, here you are, and then you've got a goal or a dream, something you want to accomplish. And our mind automatically goes a thousand steps ahead, trying to figure out all the what if scenarios. What if this happens? And you know, how will it look? When will it happen? What should it look like? And we put so much pressure on ourselves. No wonder we get overwhelmed and we have that paralysis by analysis. And I love the saying that says one step in the right direction is worth a thousand years of thinking about it. And so the reason they say success comes one step at a time is because that's exactly it. So you take a step, you check in with yourself. How am I doing? I'm doing okay. Okay. What's my next step? And then you take that step. And be willing to enjoy the ride because, you know, we're taught in school, shortest distance between two points, straight line. But in the universe, if you look at quantum physics, there's no straight lines in the universe. Even the straightest line by a drafting ruler, if you look at it under a microscope, it's filled of millions of squiggly lines. So your journey from where you are to where you want to go is going to look like a big squiggle. And so most people get frustrated because it's like, well, I'm on my way, but this happened. Oh my God, that happened. But then this happened. It's not what I wanted. And they get frustrated. (laughs) And when I look at it, so, and I love to use the example of the third job I was working at that I got laid off from. I was working in a factory, got hired on when they opened the factory. And my goal was because they're a big company around North America, had something like 40 factories around the countries between Canada and U.S., I was going to be my, a general manager of my own factory. I wanted to work for him for 40 plus years. Now, Jennifer, could you picture me as a general manager? It'd probably be the most fun factory you've ever been Yes. Yes. That's what I was going to say. It would be very fun. (laughs) It would be. I can be very efficient too, though. And so imagine my surprise when I walked in on a Monday and the general manager, and I still remember his name, Ron Humpting. I don't know if I should say that on the air. Sorry, Ron. (laughs) He he comes in, he, he goes, come into my office. And I walk in his office, he says, I want to let you know, we're shutting the factory down. You were laid off as of Friday. And I had just come back from a week holiday. And I'm like, "Uh, you couldn't tell me before I went on a holiday. And he's like, we didn't know. And my BS meter, I'm just, and that's not what upset me the most, Jennifer. What upset me the most is he then had the nerve to tell me everything I was doing wrong. And if I wanted to be successful, what I had to change. Let's just say I wasn't in the right frame of mind to hear it. I let him know what I thought of him. (laughs) <laughs> and I went out of his office, right? But now I look back and I go, you know, here at my goal, what I thought was I was going to be a general manager of my own factory. So had Ron Humpty not laid me off, I would not have found Domino's Pizza. I would not have started managing, become a franchisee, go $150,000 in debt, 
found the training of personal development, found my passion, getting to do what I do today, loving what I do. Today, I look back and I go, thank you, Ron Humpting, for laying me off. Yay, Ron! <laughs> yeah, See, now Ron's my hero. Right. He went from the villain, from a zero to the hero. <laughs> right. And so that's what people, I want them to understand about life. If you're so caught up in the, so far in the future and overwhelmed, or worse, caught up in the past and look what's going on in the world right now. This happened to me. No, it happened to generations before. Why are you still living it? You know, when people are caught so much playing the victim they're or in the future too far that they're overwhelmed, they're not present. They're not actually experiencing life. My new book I'm writing right now called The Authority Key, I talk about the four currencies of life. And the currency I focus my time on the most is the currency of experience. I want to be able to look back each day, each week and go, yeah, I did this. I did that. I don't want to look back and go, oh, where was the last five years? I don't even really know what happened the last five years. I think I just existed. That's not living, right? right? So that's kind of the way I look at it. Thank you for sharing the point A to squiggly point where we are now, because there's still so much more to come. Sometimes people can hear what you're saying, but to really hear it in those words, it's we're all there, we're all doing it. And we just got to keep moving forward. And that might be failing forward. It might be winning forward today. Tomorrow might be a fail, but you're failing forward. Just keep, you know, every failure, there's that lesson. There's that thank you moment, because if not, I would have kept going left when I should have gone right. Right. And, and, And when you understand, and it's a saying you've probably heard a lot, Jennifer, you've heard the saying, everything happens for a reason. Mm-hmm. Oh, do you believe that saying? Oh, I, I probably say it 20 times a day. Mm-hmm. Did you know that's not the complete saying? No. Okay. <laughs> that's only half the saying. <clears throat> Yet that's the part that everybody hears. See, the full saying is everything happens for a reason. And that reason is there to serve me. And what I love about it is when you understand the full statement, it now puts you into curiosity mode. Because if you ever had something happen in your life, and then maybe a couple of years later, all of a sudden you're like, that's why that happened. Mm -hmm. See, when you're in the curiosity mode, it's not like you're going to necessarily get the answer right away. Like, why did this happen? Oh, it happened because of this. It may take years or sometimes maybe you never get the full lesson from it. But the difference is, is if you look at it and you go, okay, especially in your trying times, if you look at it and you go, if everything happens for a reason and that reason's there to serve me, okay, what is the lesson I can take from this? And the moment you start looking for a lesson, now you turn it, take the energy from a negative non-supportive to, okay, what can I take that's positive out of this? What can I take that supportive? And I use the example, and I can't remember, I, I apologize if I put it in my book, but I talk about my dog attack the, of what happened to me there. You know, here I am overliving my passion and I, I, because I'm burnt out, I decide to take a year off. That year turns into three and a half years because I hadn't been taking care of my body on stage. I herniated a disc and I went through two back surgeries. And so three and a half years off. And I remember I had said in my mind, and I'd said to the universe, to God, whatever higher power you go by, I'm taking a year off of not training. All of a sudden a year came, a year went by. And I started getting those little messages, you know, those little hints, those little clues. And it's like, Robert, you said, you're taking a year off, a year's gone. You need to start living your gift again. And I ignored it because I had also become comfortable. See, I had every reason why I don't need to start training again. I'm two years into my hiatus and I'd received the message a few times and you, you, you realize, and, and Jennifer, have you ever noticed that when you ignore a lesson, it comes back again, more intense, mm-hmm. right? Yes, it does. I don't, know if you've, I don't know if that's ever happened to anybody else but me. <laughs> and two years in August 10th of 2010, all of a sudden it's a beautiful sunny day. My mother-in-law who lives across the street and up the, up from us, she calls and says, we're having a problem with the TV. Can you come help us? I'm like, Absolutely. So I walk out my front door and where I lived at the time, a beautiful playground in front of us, about 30 children playing in the playground. I walk up, I help her out. I'm coming back down the sidewalk. I'm about to cross the street to my driveway when a couple comes walking with a dog. I'm an animal lover. I love animals. I have now on our acreage, I have six cats and our pet pig. You know? <laughs> I'm a fur baby mama. I have two kitties. So I'm uh, a, yeah. 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 And that's a whole nother story too. Right. And so, I see them and they're, they're standing in front of my driveway. And so I say, hey, is she friendly? A big bull mastiff, 160 pound dog. Oh, wow. And they're like, no, no, she's not. We just actually rescued her. We're rehabilitating her. 
So they stayed in front of my driveway. I'm on the sidewalk. We're talking. We're having a conversation. Eventually, I kneel down, and they slowly bring her over, and I let her smell my hand. No problem. Pet her head, pet her neck. Not a problem until I go to stand up. And the moment I went to stand up, she lunged at my throat. And now, Jennifer, because of the standing motion, my chin had dropped. And so instead of getting my throat, she got my chin. And she latched on and proceeded to try and drag me to the ground. And I'm in, instantly in shock. And the only thought going through my head is I know if she gets me on the ground, I'm done. So I stand up and she's now hanging off of my jaw. And the gentleman that was walking her, he actually had to pry her jaws off of me. And now it's taking both him and his wife to hold her back because she's lunging back at me. Blood all over the place. And now I'm thinking about the kids behind me. And I'm like, get her out of here. I'm like, I live right here. Just get her away from these kids. So they start dragging the dog up the street. I'm walking up my driveway, blood dripping all over the place. I'm getting close to the door and I'm about to open the door. And now the thought in my head goes to, if I get blood in the house, my wife's going to kill me. (laughs) No, that was your thought. (laughs) It's amazing where you go when you're in shock, right? I open the door. I think I'm being calm and I'm like, Roxanne? And I'm so calm. She comes running. She sees the blood. She's like, what happened? I said, a dog attacked me. She gets a towel, gets it to my chin to stop the bleeding. See, now I'm okay. I'm protected. I'm out of that fight or flight mode. So I start to pass out. And my wife sees me starting to waver and about to drop. And she knows if I do, she can't get me to the hospital. So as I'm wavering and I'm about to pass out, she looks at me and goes into what we call her warrior mode. She looks at me. She goes, don't you faint. Get to that car. Yes, dear. (laughs) <laughs> and, and so, I know, love it. In, 30, in 32 years of marriage, Jennifer, I've learned the two most important words in a relationship. Yes, dear. Ah. Those are the two most important. <laughs> now, great. I get to the hospital, and um, on dog bites, they don't like to close the wound up because they want any bacteria to flush out. So three puncture wounds under my goatee, they just cleaned them up, and they wanted to flow. But the dog had actually ripped through my chin, and so it took nine stitches to close that up. Now, in that moment, I had that choice, and everybody has a choice. See, I believe that when you realize you have choice, no matter what's going on, you have the choice on how do you react to something. So in my mind, it came up, everything happens for a reason, that reason's there to serve me, and I'm like, I don't need that lesson right now. (laughs) But because it came into my mind, I said, so why did this happen? And and the first time it was, why the did this happen? Mm -hmm. But then I said, no, why did this happen? And all of a sudden, a universal principle came to my mind that says, everything that's not utilized is eliminated. See, one inch further, the dog would have got my jugular, and me and my gift would have been gone just like that. And in that moment, I knew I had to come out of retirement. I didn't have to come out financially, but I had to because it was my gift to the world. Mm -hmm. And if I didn't live my gift, my gift could be taken away that quickly. Mm -hmm. And that was the day I decided that I was coming out of retirement. And because of my back, it still took a full year and a half to fully come out of retirement. But I will train till I cannot train anymore because this is my gift. And and I'm like, universe, I do not need that lesson again. I got it. Thank you very much. (laughs) Thank you. We're good. (laughs) Yep, We're good. No more needing that lesson. No. Yep. Exactly it. And and when you set your intention to something, because I'm a huge believer in law of attraction. And have you ever noticed, Jennifer, that the moment you make a commitment and a decision, the universe bends over backwards to support you, Mm -hmm. right? And so within two weeks, literally within two weeks of me making that decision that I was going to train again, all of a sudden I'm getting a call asking me to come out of retirement, that they really want me to start training around the world again. And it was an easy answer. It was like, yes, (laughs) I'm there. I'll be there. (laughs) And, 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 And because I knew I would not put my body through again, what I went through on the, the, uh, um, two back surgeries, one of the first things I knew I was going to do is I would not go through a third back surgery. I, you know, when I woke up from the second one, I'm like, never again. And through my physio and my rehab and that time of being laid up, like the one time in bed, six over six weeks where I couldn't move. And I don't know, but nothing as humbling as when someone else has to wipe your ass because you can't, that really humbles a person very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. And so I knew I would never do that again. And I put on an extra 50 pounds. And I'm like, if I'm going to start training again, I'm going to strengthen my core. I love that your last name is Pilates because I was doing a lot to (laughs) strengthen that core. I, um, I released over 50 pounds and I, you know, made a decision that, you know, overliving my passion all the time I was spending on stage bad. I went from that to not living at all, just as bad. 
I want a little more balance. And what I'd love your audience to understand is balance. People think balance is everything perfect. It's like, oh, right. <laughs> but to me, in my experience, balance is everything's always adjusting. And balance is when you correct, 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 mm -hmm. instead of letting it get way out of whack. So when they asked me to come out of retirement, I said, absolutely. But I will let you know, I will only do 20 trainings a year maximum, or wherever in the world you use me. So even with all the traveling, I still have six months off at home because I like my time off. I love my time off. And so for the last eight plus years, while I was out of retirement, I was doing 19, 20 or 21 trainings wow. consistently. See, when you set your boundaries, and this is another thing for your audience to understand, you're the one who decides what your boundaries are. And you're the one that decides if you allow your boundaries to be pushed or not, because people will test you. So don't blame them. If you've set your boundary and you let them push you through your boundaries, you've got to take the ownership of it. Mm -hmm. And that was a big lesson for me as well. Mm -hmm. It sounds like you're a big believer of set your own schedule and it will be filled. Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yep. Yeah. And that's it. And, and, you know, today I actually, I live by the calendar on my phone. My wife and I live by this. And one of the practical skills that we have, because we learned about that balance thing, when we do our calendar, the first thing we put on our calendar before anything else is our balance pieces. Time for ourselves, time for each other, time for our health. All that goes on. Because if you look at finance, wealth rule number one, pay yourself first. So if that's true for money, why wouldn't you do that for time as well? Mm -hmm. So we pay ourselves first. And, and it, it's funny because, you know, you have to be a little bit sometimes um, selfish with this, Jennifer. As an example, people go, well, Robert, you're flying. You, you're not doing many trainings in North America anymore, but you're flying 10, 12, 16 hours at a time on a plane to go overseas. Why would you do that? Well, number one, I love experiencing all different cultures. The people I meet are amazing, but there's also selfish reason. See, the moment I step on a plane and I sit in my seat, that's my time. That's Robert's time. I don't do work. I don't connect to Wi-Fi, even if the plane has it. I read because I love to read. I watch movies because I love my movies. Mm -hmm. I get a little sleep. I eat good food and I drink great wine because I know that the moment I step off the plane, the next three to five days, I'm on stage up to 12 hours a day giving. And so if I don't replenish me, if I don't take care of me, I can't fully give to my audience, if mm -hmm. that makes sense. What number one piece of advice would you give to someone who is struggling with that? Struggling with being okay with taking care of themselves first. They need that help with that mindset. Yeah, start small. It doesn't have to be anything like, okay, Robert said go on a 16 hour flight, I'll do that. <laughs> yeah. Now, hey, if that works for you and that's the way you get started, get started. But it could be something as simple as, you know what? Um, you, I know you love to read. Mm -hmm. So giving yourself permission to take 30 minutes and just sit down with no distractions, just read a good book. Um, it could be something as simple as when my mind gets too crazy, I will take a 25 minute time out. I'll grab my earbuds and I use the app calm C A L M. I love this. And I used a free version. I love the sound of rain. So I'll put on the sound of rain for 20 minutes, 25 minutes. I'll lay back in my, one of my recliners and I'll just let the sound. It takes about six, seven, eight minutes for my mind to quiet. But then the remaining time I rejuvenate like crazy. Mm -hmm. So start with something small. Remember that one step in the right direction worth a thousand years of um, thinking about it. Mm -hmm. So just start doing little practices, little practices, uh, meditation. You know, I, I, and this is coming from one of the most closed minded people you could have ever met when I was younger, because, and you know, this saying probably people who outside the country may not recognize the saying, but um, I grew up in a very red neck community. Okay. The city I was living in named Red Deer. It even has a nickname Red Neck Red Deer because it is red neck. In Canada? <laughs> no, in Can yeah. Oh, yeah. Stop. Well, Alberta, we're all farm country. We have cowboys. We have you know, oil and, and farms. I honestly had no idea. Are you yeah. a cowboys well, in Canada? I'm thinking oh, yeah. hockey and skiing. That's all no, I've no, known. No. Hey, last week, my wife and I were out camping and we went to a rodeo because we love our rodeos. Rodeos are amazing. I love this. You learn something every day. Honest to goodness, I'm so naive. I really, I had no idea. That is so cool. Okay, so, well, because where do you live right now? Right now I'm down in Florida. Okay, so you're very close to Texas. And you know what Texas is like? Mm -hmm. That's Alberta. No. We have oil. Yeah, 
We have some of the greatest rodeos are in Texas and Alberta. In fact, we have what's called the Calgary Stampede, which is the greatest outdoor show on earth, where it's a 10 day professional rodeo, a hundred thousand dollar prize for the finals for each event. I would love As that. A, I, oh, I am a Southern belle at heart where I was born. Yeah. I always say it was below the Mason Dixon line. So y'all just, well, then, then I invite you, you got to come to Alberta. You'll <laughs> love the rodeos we do. Um, we're probably going to go to one this coming weekend because there's all these professional rodeos and the amateur rodeos going on all summer long. And we're fully open again in Alberta. So we've been taking in rodeos and just enjoying camping, loving life. So it is, it's really good that way. Yeah. That's, I'm going to yeah. take you up on it. I would love to, that sounds amazing. <laughs> Well, and, and it is, and it's little joys like that, right? So take that first step and, and find something that you enjoy and you'll notice how then it becomes where this is a necessity. Mm-hmm. I, I'm going to use a friend's saying, he, he has a saying for what he does. He says, luxury once experienced becomes a necessity. And the same is true for when you're taking care of yourself. When you understand the power of taking care of you, Look, it took me going through back surgeries and burnout to realize it was time to take care of me because you cannot give what you do not have. So if you're struggling with it, this is why it's also important to surround yourself with, listen to my words on this, growth-minded people. And um, I was a big believer in surrounding yourself with like-minded people. And for years, I would say that. And even on stage, I'd have a room of a thousand students. I'd go, don't, does everybody feel amazing that you're filled with a room of like-minded people? And they're like, yeah. And then last year, a mentor gave me another paradigm shift. He said, think of it. If you're surrounded with like-minded people that are complainers, you're going to be a complainer, right? He said, a growth-minded person, though, they're the person that will be, they're there to pick you up when you stumble. They're there to be your greatest cheerleader when you're succeeding. But more importantly, they're going to be the person that is willing to have the tough conversations with you when need be. So as an example, Again, I have no problem saying I would not be where I am today if it wasn't for my wife, because left to my own devices, I'd be in a job miserable, but comfortable. And she's not willing to let me play smaller than I am, even if it means kicking me in the ass and saying step up. And so when you surround yourself with growth minded people, your friends may notice that, hey, Jennifer, um, you're looking a little burnt out. Have you been taking care of yourself? What are you doing to, and it's one of my four phases of life, pamper yourself. What are you doing to pamper yourself? And so you have, you set agreements with your friends to call you on stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Because it's easy to get caught up and just work, 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 work. And it's amazing how even a little break can make all the difference in the world. It truly can. I made a few shifts actually these last few weeks because I was not balanced. (laughs) I was not near balanced. I used to really believe in hustling. The first half of my life, I was a hustler. And right. now that I'm someone that just goes with the flow and finds the alignment, everything comes much easily. The last mm-hmm. two weeks that I have taken and shifted my schedule where most of the beginning of the day is all about me, whether it's going to take a swim, going to the beach, I'm working half as much and the revenue is still there. Yes. And, and you know what you've, what you've done is you've shifted from being busy which everybody's great at being busy. Mm -hmm. And they're like, I have no time to do anything else. Oh my God, I'm so busy. I got family, I got a job, I got business. Ah!" And you become productive. Mm -hmm. Huge difference right there. See, when we're also conditioned being busy, we're not focused. But when we're productive in one hour and and research shows, you know, uh, uh, it's about an hour you can go before you start getting distracted. So I could say, hey, I'm going to write um, the new book. I'm going to spend some time doing it. I could come to my office. Eight hours later, I come out and I'm like, oh, it doesn't really seem like I got a lot done on the book. What was I doing? Oh, I was checking social media. I was responding to emails. I was doing chats. Oh, and I wrote a little bit of the book. (laughs) But if I put on, and that's the second thing that goes on my schedule now. So first part is the pamper, taking Mm -hmm. care of ourselves. The second part, I put what's called focus time. And I might put 10 to 11 write book. Now in that time, if it's on the calendar, everybody that knows me knows I'm not answering emails. I'm not doing anything. And in that one hour of being productive, I can be more productive in one hour than six hours of being busy. Mm -hmm. And so no wonder you free up time. Right. And you feel more rejuvenated. Mm -hmm. Shocking. Shocking. And I know that you have a great meditation philosophy. Would you share that with us? (laughs) Well, again, being a closed-minded person, I didn't believe in that stuff. 
Um, and then when I was introduced to personal development, then um, actually it was T. Harvecker. He brought his Zen master, amazing woman by name is Sherry Huber. She has 17 phenomenal books. She's out of Mount Shasta, California. I don't even know where you find her books, but she's an amazing woman. And she offered a four-day Zen retreat. And so my wife and I signed up and I'm like, now picture anybody that knows me, it was a 40 Zen retreat of complete silence. Imagine me being silent for four days. I can't. I, I really my, can't. <laughs> my, my wife was in, I think it was the favorite time of her life. <laughs> <laughs> and so here we are at the Zen retreat and at night we could ask questions. And there was a question that was bugging me, but I didn't ask it. And then a woman did. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> she said, Sherry, when I'm here and I'm in this space, meditating so easy. But when I go back home, I'm busy. I've got a busy life. I, I'm not going to have time to sit there 20 minutes and go, oh, you know, she says, what do I do? And Sherry's answer changed my life. She said, meditation is simply being present. So in your day-to-day -day life, anything that you're truly present doing, you're meditating. So as an example right now, you and I, Jennifer, we're here talking. And if you've been connected and talking with someone, and even though they may be there physically, you can tell their mind is somewhere else. Have you ever experienced that? Oh, sure. Right? Mm -hmm. Totally. And that's what happens to most people. <laughs> so one of the things I do is my goal is to see how much every day I can meditate. So if I'm connected with someone, I'm there with them. I'm aware of everything else that's going on, but I'm there with them present. So at the same time, I'm meditating. And I do that with my students. I do that with family members. I do that with my wife. Because look at what happens. People go, oh, my family, to get successful, my family's going to pay the price because they think it's about the quantity of time. And also, if I don't have a lot of quantity of time, my family is going to fall apart. But family and people will take quality over quantity anytime. When I'm on the other side of the planet, I could come off stage after 12 hours. I'm tired. I'm wasted. I want to go to sleep. But my wife and I have a commitment to connect. And even if, it, even if it's only five minutes, and I love FaceTime for this, even if it's five minutes, we connect because now we can see each other. And one of the things we do, if we notice the other person drifting, we don't get upset. We don't get angry. We don't yell. We just simply say, come back to me. And by saying that, it's a signal that you're drifting. Come back to me. It's like, yeah, hi, I see you, right? And it's little things like that that make all the difference in the world, I find, right? I love that. Come back to me. We're coming to that time in the show, Robert. Will I ask that one question? Are you ready? Yes. Only because you ask so nicely. <laughs> what is one thing that no one knows about you? Probably that I don't drink coffee or why I don't drink coffee. Okay. Do tell. And I never figured it out until it became so obvious. Like, duh. Uh, when I was one years old, I actually pulled a cup of coffee on myself. And I ended up with second to third degree burns to 70% of my body. And today on my shoulder, the only remaining scar is still a scar on my left shoulder from that burn when I was one years old. Oh my goodness. And so and you, you wonder why I don't drink coffee. <laughs> do you drink tea? I drink tea. Okay. Yeah. But, but I, wow. I actually get a physical reaction. I've tried drinking coffee, love the smell of coffee, but I get a physical reaction and when it happened, that's when my family discovered I was allergic to penicillin because I was sick and I was burnt and they started feeding me penicillin. I got sicker. They'd give me more. I'd get sicker until it almost killed me. When a doctor finally came in, ripped out all the IVs and it's like, this kid's obviously allergic to penicillin. And then a week later, they started pumping penicillin into me again and almost killed me again. So, oh yeah, my little, goodness. you know, a little anchor to not liking coffee. Yeah, definitely not a coffee man. Okay, so we'll have no coffee sponsors this round. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but tea, let's do tea. Let's do tea. I'm I, all about the tea. I Me like too. vanilla chai. Chai tea. <sighs> mm, 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 mm. Mm. Right? Hello? <laughs> oh, my gosh. Well, this has been so amazing, Robert. I cannot thank you enough for sharing your energies and your insights. This has been great. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, my pleasure. Maybe next time we just have some fun finally. You know, yeah. it was so serious. This <laughs> I know. Totally. Totally. Before we leave, what is one last sentiment that you would like to leave with our audience? Mm -hmm. It's the way I sign every uh, email and every autograph I do. Always live with passion. Beautiful. I love it. Yeah. So yeah. with that, 
let our audience know where is the best place to reach out and get in contact with you so that they too can get some clues to success. <laughs> well, you can follow me on Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Um, really, actually, because you were so gracious, Jennifer, to have me on your podcast and your listeners, like I, I'm, I'm a big believer that your time is one of our most valuable commodities. And the fact that your listeners have taken time to be here and listen, I so appreciate that. And so as a gift to them, what I'd love for them to do is if they just go to robertrealpel.com, my website, my name, hello, R-O-B-E-R-T-R-I-O-P-E-L-M-O-U-S-E. Don't put the M-O-U-S-E <laughs> part in though. Just robertrealpel.com. They can actually download the full digital version of Success Left a Clue as our gift to them. Oh my gosh, wow. everyone, you must go do it. I love this book. Ah, that is so kind and generous of you. Thank you. Oh, and it, but it does come with a caveat because you've read the book. You understand it's not just that book you read, put on the shelf and make it shelf help you. It's a workbook. So it's got the action steps in it because step number three is action. And, and so it's got the action steps in it. And I'll even say, did you do the last action? If not, stop reading right now. Go back and do that action because people are creatures of habit. So I'd love for them to have that as our gift to them. Thank you. That is so kind. And everyone, if you head over to jenniferplies.com after the show, in the show notes, all of this information will be there. So it's very easy just to click and go through and you too can start reading and be well on your way to your journey of success. Thank you again, Robert. This has been amazing. And I can't wait to come and visit you in Alberta. <laughs> <laughs> come on over. Come on over, Jennifer. Yeah. Come on over. I'm going to bring my cowboy boots and my cowboy hat. We're going to go to a rodeo. Right? Yes. Yep, that's it. That's it's going to be awesome. All right. Well, as we say, everyone, until next time. Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode. Please remember to rate, review, and subscribe to Empowered Within with Jennifer Pilates. Your feedback is important. It helps me to connect with you and gives me insight into who you are and what you're enjoying about the show. For today's show notes and discount codes from today's sponsors, head over to jenniferpilates.com. Until next time, may you live an empowered life from within.